Hello and welcome to another installment brought to you by the Harm Reduction Task Force. We have a very special guest today. Chris, would you uh, do us the pleasure of introducing yourself? Hi, um, I'm really happy to be here. Um, uh, my name is Chris Grella and I'm the director of the Integrated Substance Abuse Programs at UCLA, which is a multidisciplinary research group that focuses on various issues regarding substance use, epidemiology, treatment, policy, um, interventions. And I'm, like I said, happy to be here to talk today on the topic of methamphetamine. And we have Zach here with us as well. Uh, hi, I'm Zach Coyle. I'm a director of Santa Monica Outreach. Um, and uh, I'm an LCSW. I've been in the field for about 15 years. And I'm Carrie Leonard, the Director of Learning and also your host of these Harm Reduction Task Force panels. All right, Chris, why don't you kick us off? Okay, um, so my understanding today is that we're going to have a very um, broad and general overview of issues around methamphetamine use uh, because that is an issue of concern um, in Los Angeles and in California generally. Um, so I'm just going to give an overview of some of what we know, basic principles, and we can um, go from there on, as questions come up. So just to, to set the stage here, uh, methamphetamine, as I'm sure most of you know, is a very powerful, highly addictive synthetic stimulant. And the operative word here is synthetic. When stimulants and other substances are composed of synthetic substances, they tend to be more powerful and have a more powerful effect on the brain. Um, it comes in many forms, many different names for it. Um, this differs regionally. So in Hawaii, it's known as ice. Crystal was popular for a while. Um, but altogether, it is a white, odorless, bitter tasting powder that dissolves easily. So that makes it very um, flexible in terms of how people use it. It can be smoked, inhaled, injected, or orally ingested. And what's critical about the way people ingest it is it makes a difference in how fast the substance reaches the brain. So when you smoke it or inject it, it and this is true for all substances, it is a very rapid method of entering into the bloodstream and going quickly to the brain, which has a very intense and powerful effect that creates this, the, what we call abuse liability. It makes it highly addictive. Um, <clears throat> the rush, initial rush, lasts for only a few minutes, very pleasurable, of course, um, and creates that, that um, uh, craving for sustaining that feeling over time. Snorting or oral ingestion also produces euphoria, but not as intense, intense, the onset takes a little longer. So because of the way it moves through the body and travels to the brain, um, there's often a cycle of binging and crashing, which is intense periods of use followed by crashing. Um, and so what we see often is people using methamphetamine go on a prolonged run where they have a very sustained period of use after which they crash. Um, overdose is possible with methamphetamine use, and it's particularly a risk when it's combined with other substances, which we see frequently. People combining methamphetamine with opioids, which is very dangerous, um, street opioids, fentanyl, carfentanyl, there's continuing evolution of different synthetic products that can be combined with methamphetamine. And this potentiate and creates a much higher intense effect and risk of overdose. Do you wanna ask um, a question? Yeah, yeah, I had a couple of things. So mm -hmm. sometimes, it, is it, that the overdose is because people are intentionally mixing it on the street or is it because um, it's being cut by dealers or, or mm -hmm. things like that? What's, both. What, what are we it's seeing? Both. Mm -hmm. People often don't know what they get. And when we do studies looking at the substances that are on the streets, people maybe through arrest, confiscations, uh, testing, labs, uh, the composition is highly varied. It depends on what's available. Uh, people often don't know what they're consuming. And this is a very big risk, particularly as the synthetic substances keep evolving. Um, and, and what's interesting is we're taping this during the period of the, uh, 
COVID uh, pandemic, what we've noticed is that drug supply chains have been interrupted during this period. Everything's been made a little more complicated. So there's even less certainty right now about what you're consuming on the streets. Sometimes combination usage is intentional and um, that also creates a higher risk of adverse outcomes. So your, your feeling about things like, because what we've been seeing is people who are uh, meth users having more overdoses as a result of fentanyl. Do you, you think that that's commonly because in the supply chain, they're mixing in things to kind of produce different batches? Correct. I do believe that. I also think that I'm a big believer that people use what's available that we all, you know, there's the whole theory about people seek out substances, the kind of self-medication hypothesis that people seek out substances to address the problems, the, the, the symptoms that they have. So if they're depressed, they may seek out a stimulant. I actually don't believe that theory. I believe in the environmental theory, which is people use what is available on the streets. They may like it, may have a preference for certain things, but we particularly see that because people the old model was kind of a singular substance. What we see now is people are more likely to be poly substance users, and it's really about availability and opportunity, I believe. Is that why you kind of see through history there being like kind of eras of certain drugs where there's like a heroin era, cocaine right. era? Right. Era. Yeah. You know, the, the history of substance use is another topic, and it's really fascinating. And it really has to do with drug supply chains and we have more globalization and we have more global availability and transport systems. What's interesting about meth and made it unique compared to let's say earlier stimulants, cocaine, which has an organic component that it begins with. So those had to follow particular supply routes, um, which could be disrupt disrupted with interdiction. With a purely synthetic substance, you can move your supply, you need precursor chemicals that you can develop labs in different places. So it's, it's a little different pattern and there's a little bit more flexibility because you can set up a lab anywhere that you have an open space as long as you can get the chemicals. So with increasing synthetic substance availability, some of which come from overseas, some of which come up through the border, um, we see increasing availability and much more complicated, um, diverse range of substances out there. All right, um, let me just talk very briefly about the kind of physical effect. Um, anytime you talk about substance use, we always wanna bring in the fact that it affects the brain. And I talked about that in terms of how it's ingested. So what's actually happening underlying um, the effects that I talked about, the intense rush is this immediate spike in dopamine. So everybody knows dopamine is that part, that neurotransmitter that's released in your brain that gives you that pleasurable good feeling. And it's naturally released when you engage in pleasurable activities. It's a good thing when we get that good feeling. All substances abuse enhance dopamine to some extent. The thing with methamphetamine is it's extremely intense in the way it spikes up the level of dopamine very rapidly. So you can see that here. This is just a graph of the spike in dopamine and the nucleus accumbens um, over the time period. So it's a rapid spike and then a gradual decay. So that's what's underlying this use, this pattern of use and um, uh, this rush pattern is to sustain this very high level. And dope, the effect of methamphetamine is in, much more intensive than the effect of the organic based stimulants such as cocaine. Each time we add more synthetic components, this spiking gets more intense which makes them more addictive and also makes the consequences on the brain more severe. So just a second brain slide. Um, so the, this shows you a normal healthy brain scan of a, a subject that's not using uh, substances. You see the bright vivid colors. Those are the dopamine transporters. You see healthy activity in the brain. <clears throat> this is a brain slide of somebody who's been using methamphetamine for a long time. And it looks very eerily similar to somebody who is suffering from Parkinson's disease. So you see the deterioration in the ability of these transport systems to work healthy in a healthy manner because they've been so overused and just pumped up over time so that the level of stimulation of the brain completely changes. This concept called neuroplasticity, the brain adapts 
to this extremely high overload of dopamine. The reason why this is relevant when you're working with methamphetamine users is to try to help take it out of the context. You know, we have a history of talking about individual will and willpower. People who have used substances of abuse, particularly something as powerful as methamphetamine, their brains have been altered. Their brains need to heal. They need to restore um, a, a normal functioning in the brain. It takes time. So sometimes we found it very helpful to give people that understanding is a tool in their recovery. It's not just about willpower and the old belief about moral, if only you have good character, you know, you could fight through this. You're, you're suffering from something very severe and it takes time. Chris, how much time does it normally take for the well, brain to heal? That's a really good question. There's a lot of research on, at, so for instance, and we'll sh talk in a moment about some of the cognitive effects on methamphetamine. So it disrupts memory, cognition. So we'll can bring people in, in recovery over time and look at how long does it take to restore normal cognitive response, let's say to a memory test. And, you know, after about four to six weeks, we start to see the cognitive functions coming back. I'm going to move to the next slide because this is some of what we'll be talking here. Some of the other things may take a while longer, and it really depends on how intense the use was and how sustained. So how for very intense sustained activity over time, it can be a really long time um, of healing. And sometimes there may be permanent effects. And that's really talking in the most sustained um, severe. So what are the things that we know about the effects of various substances on the brain is that whatever the short-term effects are, um, you'll see the opposite when you're in the period of withdrawal. So a basic principle of biology is whatever effect you have in your central nervous system by ingesting a substance, you get the opposite effect when that substance is being metabolized. The body is trying to restore that, that set point. So the short-term effects of methamphetamine and why it's often very desirable for people, increased activity, kind of an excitability, um, uh, decreased appetite. Uh, yes, some people actually like the benefits initially um, of uh, loss of appetite. Heightened sexual activity. There's a strong relationship between um, methamphetamine use and sexual activity that can put people at risk um, of HIV and STDs. So that's um, something we also have to take into account when we're uh, working on prevention uh, and interventions um, is that relationship. Insomnia, um, you know, methamphetamine was used uh, long ago um, in, the, in the military to help pilots, uh, still it's used as a stimulant and it, you know, other forms of it, to help pilots who are flying for, you know, 15, 20 hours um, on missions. Um, and truck drivers, uh, so it has that benefit if you're if you need to stay awake for a long period of time, and of course euphoria. At the heart of all substances is that pleasurable good feeling. The effect on the body, though, is a stimulation of rapid heartbeat, irregular it can be a regular heartbeat, and increased blood pressure. Which this is starting to get us into the dangerous territory. So again, the more use, the more sustained use, uh, the more these things become problematic. This heightened state of excitability. As use persists over time, these, and we again, think back to the brain, you have more sustained use, no periods of downtime, but just, um, you know, maybe intermittent brief periods of downtime, but more sustained periods of use. We begin to see an anxiety, confusion, agitation. And this is probably what you see among people if you're working in outreach um, and different settings where people are not in treatment systems or not utilizing services and they've had prolonged periods of use you may see uh, confusion, agitation, the cognitive impairment I referred to, attention and memory problems, um, argumentative and violent behavior vary against uh, periods of sustained use. And then the onset of psychotic symptoms. And this is where it gets very problematic. And in fact, for providers, it's often a real challenge. Am I working with someone who has an underlying psychosis or somebody who's been using for a long period of time? And the truth is we don't really know often until there's a period of, of sustained abstinence from the substance. We, we don't know exactly. So you have to treat, use behavioral strategies that are um, de-escalation and behavioral interventions that where you don't really know what's going on sometimes. 
hallucinations, delusions, severe weight loss. So again, the decreased appetite, which may have a, a beneficial effect, some people may like, but over a period of time can become very severe. Tooth decay, um, there is the phenomenon of meth mouth, um, this um, deterioration of the teeth, um, both from poor nutrition and, and lack of dental hygiene, but the act of the substance on the dental um, matter. Um, and also teeth grinding. So that kind of compulsive repetitive activity, again, the overstimulation. Um, and sores, skin sores, there can be compulsive behaviors such as um, face scratching and picking. Um, and this can become very pronounced. Um, one, of course, of the severe um, adverse effects is overdose. And as we mentioned a moment ago, combining meth with other substances, especially the opioids, is a very toxic combination. So the opioids um, depress the respiratory system and overdose from opioids causes, stems from a, the, the, um, the, the lung functions slowing down. Um, we have a different effect with methamphetamine, which is elevating the blood pressure in the heart. So when people overdose from methamphetamine, it's often from a stroke or a heart attack. However, combining substances creates such high levels of toxicity that you can have elevated blood pressure, respiratory depression at the same time, and it can be, again, a very lethal combination. What we're seeing now in Los Angeles and around the country are increased overdose of combination stimulants and opi opioids. For a long time, we've all been focused on the opioid crisis, and certainly that's been a, a, a very dramatic surge in deaths due to opioids but we're seeing increasingly a larger and larger share of overdoses that involve both opioids and um, stimulants, particularly methamphetamine. Other parts of the country is more likely to be cocaine. So what happens when people stop using after using for a sustained period of time? Well, again, it's the opposite of the things that we saw, the initial short-term effects. Whereas before we saw this heightened elevation of activity, now we see depression, um, anxiety, fatigue from period, long periods of sleeplessness and insomnia. Anhedonia is the sense, and this is what happens when people are in early recovery, the sense of nothing matters, nothing is worthwhile. That real kind of lost sense of what do I have to live for? This is a really hard, challenging period of people are, have gone through withdrawal and they're in early recovery. Intense craving, one of the interesting characteristics of the stimulants is they do um, in the effects on the brain, the stimulants act in the part of the brain that have to do with memory and learning. So the effect of the drug is deeply embedded in the emotional centers of the brain, which are related to the learning centers of the brain. So you have very strong associations of the drug use with the feelings and the settings and the people with whom the person was using. Those get encoded in the memory centers and that creates um, triggers for people when they encounter those settings or people or situations. So the, tr the cravings for methamphetamine and other stimulants is very um, intense in the withdrawal phase, and that's one of our biggest challenges in recovery. The psychotic symptoms and cognitive impairments may persist, this gets back to Carrie's question, for a while, but will diminish over time for the most part. There have been some case studies of um, psychotic uh, onset that persists over time, but those tend to be more rare. Do you have any questions on this? This is a lot of information on the sequence of events from the initial onset of use long-term and withdrawal. Yeah, I have a question more about, so when you talked about combining meth with um, opioids or say fentanyl or heroin, mm -hmm. what would be the motivation for, for someone to combine such seemingly different right. um, drugs. Like if you're, yeah. if you're gonna take something to <laughs> increase your activity or speed you up, why, what would be the motivation to combine it with an opioid or something that sort yeah. of brings you down? You know, that's a really good question. I've thought about that a lot because I did a long-term cohort study of people who, <clears throat> excuse me, were originally using heroin. And what we found is when cocaine became very prevalent, um, over time, they started using cocaine. And my question was, well, if you like the kind of sedative effects of heroin, why were you um, then attracted to a stimulating effect? So part of that is um, my 
my belief in this opportunity and availability. People use what's available. Um, but also, it's possible that people like the way opioids kind of put a little bit of a, take a little bit of the edge off the stimulants. So we hear people talk about that. They like that effect. Um, so it's opportunity. It's what's available. It's also when you're into a heavy, a period of heavy use, you're often in a group. And it's often like, try this. This is, this is part of what people are doing is seeking out new and novel experiences. So sometimes it's experimentation um, with new substances, it's availability, and sometimes it's, I kind of like the use. You know, in the old days, we called it speedballing, combining heroin and cocaine. So it's always been, it seems somewhat nonsensical, but it's always been a part of how people who are using heavily may approach different substances, which is trying out different things and how it feels. I mean, I, I, I heard, I, I'm kind of curious, I'm following up with what you said about, um, about self-medication, because I, I mm -hmm. think that's a real buzzword in um, people trying to make sense of people using and the idea that, oh, there's someone's brain chemistry is seeking this kind right. of stimulation or this kind right. of depression. Right. Um, this is, yeah, yeah. But maybe what you're kind of getting at is more that this is not necessarily like one drug for one symptom, but more this like emotion, underlying emotional exactly. imbalance and exactly. control and um, feeling of a, an experience of like, I'm in control of my emotional state. And so seeking any kind of substance is just kind of trying to have more predictive experience in life. And like, I, I know that I'm gonna take this and something's gonna happen to me. Yes. And it's not, not so much like, I'm, I have a brain that needs more dopamine. It's right. more like I have an emotional, spiritual kind of psychological makeup that makes me want to just feel different. Exactly. I think, you know, the early hypothesis of the self-medication effect was very intuitively made sense. Oh, I'm going to use, I'm, you know, I'm going to, I'm like too hyper. I'm going to use a sedative. Uh, I'm depressed. I'm going to use a stimulant. It's, it was overly, it, it had an element of truth, which is people want to alter how they feel. And Zach, that was your point. But it's not so one-on-one. -on -one. I think it's exactly what you said, which is, I don't like how I feel. I want to feel different. I'm going to try what's available to feel different. So there is a self-medication component, but it's not in a drug specificity. It's, I don't like how I feel. I want to feel different. And that's our challenge, working with people using methamphetamine or any substance, which is the truth is people want to feel different because they're dealing with lots of hard issues. And how do we work with people? And this gets us into the final topic, which is recovery. How do we work with people who have found a way to feel different, but it's not a very functional way to feel different because it has real health risks and possible real adverse um, mortality and, and morbidity effects. So if we move into that part of our discussion, um, we know that people coming into treatment in California, is, methamphetamine is the most commonly used substance. This isn't true around the rest of the country. It has been largely a West Coast phenomenon, although also Midwest, um, Pacific Northwest, and Hawaii, uh, and, so, and parts of the um, South. <clears throat> And also people coming in typically are using multiple substances as we've been talking about. Um, there's no current FDA approved medication. There's been a lot of research trying to find a medication. For opioids, we have clear medications because opioids work very specifically on the opioid receptors. And we have medications that can target those receptors and propel the opioid molecule out of those receptors. And they're very effective for only that substance, because it's very specific to the opioid receptors. We don't have that with the stimulants. We've tried using um, antidepressants um, to treat stimulant addiction. Sometimes there's some effect there, particularly if somebody's dealing also with depression. But really, we have our tools that we have for all of our um, substances of, of abuse that we work with. Um, and I know that many of you are familiar with these tools and use them in your work, motivational interviewing working with people, meeting them where they are, um, working with them to accept um, how they feel about the substances, 
exploring with them what the substances are doing for them functionally, such as keeping them awake, helping them be functional in some settings. We know many homeless people report using methamphetamine to keep them alert at night. It's very common. It serves a function, you know, understanding that and putting that into a context where in what parts of your life is it not functional. So it's a client-centered counseling style. Cognitive behavioral therapies have been very effective for people using methamphetamine because, as I mentioned, that extremely intense craving effect. So they act on uh, teaching people strategies for evaluating settings, thinking patterns, situations that are associated with their use, identifying those cues and triggers, and teaching behavioral strategies for avoiding relapse. So they're very behaviorally oriented. Uh, and I think this is what is, we see a lot of good outcomes using these strategies because it teaches people other ways to cope in these stressful situations. And again, coupling that with this is what's happening in your brain and it makes sense that you feel this in this situation and here are some strategies you might try. Contingency management is a, or you may use this in, a, in other forms of work that you're doing. It's a system of um, using rewards, which can be tangible vouchers, cash even, so uh, to strengthen new behaviors. And, you know, contingency management is really effective. We all use it, you know, if we set up a reward scale. I mean, I'm really attuned to, am I getting, you know, my exercise in? And, you know, if my, my you know, program on my cell phone goes off, that I've met my goal, it, it really is rewarding to me. It's that basic principle. It's using rewards to help people move incrementally to adopt new behaviors. But what I really want to talk about, which I think is probably relevant to the folks that you're working with, is this concept of recovery capital, which I think is really important. So we talk about recovery, people coming into treatment or if they're not in treatment and wherever they are. People um, need skills, resources that support them in their recovery. So usually if we're encountering people through outreach or drop-in uh, or if they're trying to uh, access treatment, they're in a very depleted state in terms of what we can think of as their recovery capital. They may have burned out their, their family networks. Uh, they may have very attenuated friendship networks. They may have very limited resources. They may not have other skills that help them have meaningful um, activities and other realms of their life. They lack housing, safety, shelter. So I think that what I like about recovery capital is it gives us this holistic approach. It's not coming into treatment. I, I've worked in treatment for well over 20 years. Treatment is a very small part of what is recovery. Treatment gives people an opportunity to have a respite, to help their brain detoxify and heal and get a foundation. But what we really have to do is build their recovery capital with, we can use contingency management, that's a tool. We can use cognitive behavioral strategies. But it's about really looking at people's resources and building the supportive networks, embedding them in those networks. One thing we know about people using methamphetamine, when they get into recovery, they really bond with each other <laughs> about using methamphetamine. It's such an intense experience. That can be really supportive, helping people talk and share with others who've gone through it. This is obviously such a critical component. And and, and putting that in a larger context of what people need to build that life that gives them pleasure and meaning so that they're not seeking it through use of substances. It really gets down to that. So um, I know I've covered a lot of territory. <laughs> Other questions on this? So <clears throat> one of the things um, I know that kind of comes up naturally is um, what about what, what kind of thoughts do you have on ideas for harm reduction for people who are continuing to use um, methamphetamine, ideas that we can give our, our staff who are, um, really we do this very outward facing outreach. You know, I often tell people that we're kind of like the door to door salesman of, you know, they just can't slam the door in our face because they don't have a door to slam. And so, we, we kind of are going up to people and trying to offer them things. Not a lot of people coming to us help me get off of meth. Right. It's more this right. gentle kind of client-centered approach. Not a lot of people who are wanting to get clean. 
what kind of thoughts do you have on things our staff might be able to offer and do with people who are continuing to use? Right, right. And I'm not, um, what I have seen works is, is, as you're suggesting, meeting people where they are. So even if it's um, offering them a moment of respite in a place that feels safe to them. So if we start from that concept of recovery capital, people don't feel safe. If we can create a safe space and allow them to have an opportunity to express what they're feeling and meet them where they are with the motivational interviewing, even if it's a meal. I've seen very successful um, outreach programs engaging people through offering meals and then seeing if they're open to being in, um, I've seen people use art therapy or some kind of interaction that gradually increases their comfort level with being around people. That can be really hard. It can be really challenging, but um, I think starting with those very basic, and I know that your organization does this, but starting with the very basic subsistence needs. People really, if you ask them, what do you need? They're not gonna say drug treatment. They're gonna say, I need housing, I need food, I need shelter, and I need dental care. So it would be starting to engage people about thinking about what do they need in their life and what are the things that might help them get there in ways that we can say your substance use is serving you certain functions, but let's work on what we can do outside of that that can help get you some of your needs met. But it has to be very gradual and I think it's trust building. I know these are skills that your, your folks are already using, um, but I think it's really hard, but we know that harm reduction strategies can work with this population. So particularly though, the issue of um, sexual um, risk is a big one. And it can be starting to engage people around HIV and STD awareness, which is promoting the concept of, we're not trying to tell you not to do this, but we want you to be healthy. We want you to be safe. So really starting to build in that concept, let's look at what may keep you safe. And maybe education about not combining substances if, you know, we've talked about the complexities of that, but that's really increasing your risk. Let's try to take it down a notch and try not to use alcohol, you know, and these other substances, because that drug combination is, is really what's making the risk so much higher. So maybe even starting there, let's lower that risk, lower the risk of um, uh, STDs, HIV, and then let's talk about what can make your life feel a little safer. Yeah, it's hard. I, I know it's really challenging. Well, I like what you're saying because, you know, I think what you were talking about with the, so many people want this medication assisted treatment for different medications. We all want the magic bullet that's going to stop people from using drugs destructively. Um, and it doesn't always exist. And for meth, I think people are constantly like, what, what harm reduction methods should I, should I use? And I think it's really important to point out that just the basic human contact outreach work that we do and helping people connect to resources is harm reduction. And sometimes Absolutely. I don't think that we always see that we're doing it. Absolutely. By, by talking to people about housing, by linking them to shelter, that it's really hard for somebody to, to, to change these behaviors. And I, I've seen a lot of this stuff on the functional MRI brain mm -hmm. study. Mm -hmm with meth users there, it's a very, very hard thing to shake, but um, nutrition, medical care, you know, the basic kind of life stuff that out on the street, they may not, they may be do neglecting, but offering those services is so much of what you're talking about. And right. I don't think we always give ourselves credit for the fact that we're doing it every day because we're looking for some, you know, clean needle or, or uh, you know, paraphernalia yeah. program. And that it's so much of it is about this recovery capital. What can we offer to you in your life that helps you feel a little bit more right. hopeful? And that starts the process of empowering them. I mean, let's face it. I, I, if, if you've worked with and been around people using methamphetamine or other substances intensely for many per long periods of time, there's a, so much suffering. There's a person that's suffering in there. They don't want to be doing this. It's, it's not pleasurable after a while that initial pleasurable period wears off real quickly. But it may be the only place where people have some feeling of connection with others in their life. 
through their friends if they're embedded in a, a network. Um, it may give them some functionality. I can stay awake, I can take care of myself, I can feel a little stronger in this situation. But trying to make that connection because people have to build that recovery back and it is a long process and we don't have the medications, we don't have the magic bullets. It's learning new behaviors, learning new skills, a feeling of safety, connecting with others. So however you can do that incrementally, it starts the process and giving them the understanding, this is, this is not about you as a bad person and I know that's the approach. This is about your brain has been overstimulated for a long period of time, let's give it a chance to heal. Yeah, and I, I, <clears throat> I think it's important to point out, um, oftentimes what we're seeing in these very long-term regular users of methamphetamine is that um, that euphoria part has worn off. Oh, you know, yeah. So we see our clients in extreme joy. We see them in this immense cycle of torture where they're hallucinating. Absolutely. And, and, and I think that's really hard for um, staff who don't have the experience in their life of maybe having seen why people use these right. people seek right. the pleasure and then they get stuck in this kind of right. wheel right. because that part is gone, but the brain is still just craving, craving, craving right. because when it goes away, there just is this flatness that's right. Um, yeah, that they don't have. Yeah. Do you have any thoughts on things that um, if people are withdrawing, are there any kinds of things you would recommend trying to help provide somebody so that they, they would, I don't know, um, you know, some sort of like vitamins or anything that could help with people feeling a little bit better during that period of time? Just kind of the basics, you know? I mean, I, I mean, it sounds really simple, but you know, healthy food, water, and comfort. I mean, it is scary. People who are using, there is that initial, I, and this is the important thing. It Originally, it's a functional, using substances is functional. It works for people, it works. Then it's, as you were saying, it stops working, but the brain is still really amped up in ways that are very scary to come down from, whether you're coming down from a, a heroin uh, or opioid euphoria or a meth super stimulation, it is scary. So people need comfort, safety, and as much kind of detoxification and the healthy things that we know. But I would stress the safety. I mean, I, I'm envisioning just even having a blanket, you know, and feeling comfort, connection, human connection and acceptance. I mean, it really is that basic. It is scary. It is hard. It's really hard. And I, that's where I think the, the, I put the brain images in, letting people know this is not just about you being strong or tough enough. This is letting your brain heal. It's going to take a while. I think uh, when we look at, at treatment and recovery, we, we tend to want to find these big solutions and, and strategies. And I, I appreciate what you're talking about because sometimes it is something basic and simple that could be overlooked or we don't think to use it. Like when, when someone's crashing and providing them with food or water or a blanket as you suggested or when someone um, is experiencing paranoia simply asking them um, what helps you feel safer um, mm -hmm. I think it is a, a, a lot of these these little strategies um, that go that go a long way in yeah. addressing the, the behaviors that as they come up right um, especially yeah. if, yeah. No, I was going to say, it's scary and hard. Yeah. So any kind of reassurance, comfort, human connection. Yeah. So. Well, thank you very much, Chris. This has been extremely helpful. Um, we really appreciate your time. Zach, did you have any more questions or... Oh, we could talk about this forever, right? But, uh... <laughs> yeah, well, let me say, I so appreciate the work that you and um, People Concern are doing and all the very hard work. It's, it's so important. And yes, I'll leave with that thought about treatment. I'm a treatment researcher and I, mm -hmm. treatment is a blip in the lifespan. It gives people a chance, gives them a respite, a comfort zone, and maybe some tools, but there's so much that needs to go on in an ongoing way. So 
I'm and I just my my biggest takeaway what I, what, what I really appreciate you stressing Chris is is taking a look at people's brain um, and not that they're you know the, and that they're suffering um, mm -hmm. or they're in pain and not that that they're bad people exactly. right and right. and having that sort of lens in which we right. approach helping folks so absolutely thank you so much for that oh, it was a pleasure and and thank you and again thank you for all the work that you do thank, thank you, you.